everybody and welcome back to Southern Fried Crime, the true crime channel with a country twist. If you're new here, please remember to like, subscribe, and click on that little bell icon to be notified when new videos post. Thank you so much for listening and now on with today's case. Kelly Eckhart was only 18 years old when she was raped and murdered by a man who had no connection to her whatsoever. Previous to her murder, she was a full-time college student at Franklin College. Aside from her studies, Kelly was also a part-time worker at her local Walmart. On September the 27th, 1997, was a typical day like any other that Kelly would have. She worked her shift at Walmart and then got off and called her boyfriend. She then went to visit him for a little while before leaving to go home to her parents. Little did she or her boyfriend know that this would be the last time she would be seen alive. The next day, on September 28th, Kelly's car would be found abandoned in a rural area. The keys were still in the ignition and the lights were on, but Kelly was nowhere to be found. Four days later, Kelly's body was found naked in a ravine. She was strangled with her own shoelaces and also with her suspender. In addition to being strangled, Kelly was also shot once in the forehead. At her autopsy, semen was found inside of Kelly, so it was determined that she had also been brutally raped. In the beginning, Michael Overstreet was not a suspect in the murder of Kelly Eckhart. Michael's brother, Scott, was the first person to contact the police regarding his brother and the murder. On the morning of November the 6th, 1997, Scott went to the police to tell them what he knew about his brother and Kelly Eckhart. He said that on the morning of September the 27th, Michael had met up with him and told him that he had abducted a girl. Michael asked Scott to bring his van so that Michael could transport the girl to a rural wooded area. Scott went with his brother and he drove Michael and Kelly to a rural wooded area. He left his brother alone with Kelly. Michael now had the privacy he needed to rape and murder Kelly at that point. Later on, Michael would come back and move Kelly's body to a location known only to him. On November the 6th, 1997, police started talking to Michael Overstreet about Kelly Eckhart and her murder. Michael claimed that his brother was lying and that he did not have anything to do with the murder. Unbeknownst to Michael, fibers from Scott's van were a match to fibers pulled off of Kelly's body. Also, an eyewitness had identified him as being seen near the spot where the body was found, and the nail on the head was that semen found inside of Eckhart was a match to him and not his brother Scott. This proved conclusively that Michael Dean Overstreet was the murderer of Kelly Eckhart. On November the 10th, 1997, Michael Overstreet was arrested for the murder of Kelly Eckhart. Who was Michael Dean Overstreet and how had his path crossed with the path of Kelly Eckhart? As a child, Michael had suffered a tremendous amount of abuse at the hands of his parents. He suffered from hallucinations that consisted mostly of demons and his parents refused to get him the mental help that he needed. Later on, after the crime was committed, he would be diagnosed with psychological deterioration and schizotypal personality disorder. People with the same disorders as Michael Overstreet may lose touch with their reality. This means they may not know their own name, the time, the current day, where they are, or the person or people that they are with. This does not excuse what Michael Dean Overstreet did, but it does perhaps help to explain why he did what he did. Who was Michael Dean Overstreet and how had his path crossed with the path of Kelly Eckhart? As a child, Michael had suffered a tremendous amount of abuse at the hands of his parents. He suffered from hallucinations that consisted mostly of demons and his parents refused to get him the mental help that he needed. Later on, after the crime was committed, he would be diagnosed 
with psychological deterioration and schizotypal personality disorder. People with the same disorders as Michael Overstreet may lose touch with their reality. This means they may not know their own name, the time, the current day, where they are, or the person or people that they are with. This does not excuse what Michael Dean Overstreet did, but it does perhaps tr help to explain why he did what he did. That's all for today's case. Tell me what you think. Did Michael Overstreet receive a fair trial? Do you think the jury should have taken into consideration his mental illnesses? Thank you for listening. Please remember to like, subscribe, and click on the little bell icon to be notified when Southern Fried Crime posts new videos. That's all. Y'all have a great day.